And we're live. Round of applause, everybody. Round of applause. So welcome here, Speak Up Monday, episode number 400. Uh, I can't wait. 400, Woo! yes. So look, t t today has been maybe two years or more in the works. Uh, he's a brother who's come all the way from the US uh, to have this, uh, this incredible Q&A with us t today. He's a former vice president of a multi-billion dollar company called Kraft, which we'll get into uh, more and more. Now, for those of you, my name is Robert Ian Bonick. I'm here uh, in, in Indonesia. And what I love to do is to bring incredible people and businesses together to create profitable enterprises here in Indonesia, focusing here in, in Bali. And look, today, Robert N. Johnson, my guest, you know, I've mentioned before, you know, that he was already uh, this 25 years uh, in craft, 14 different assignments. I've got a list here of associations of which he's part, including the Smithsonian Kraft Food, Procter and Gamble, Indiana University, Adelante Foundation from Honduras, the Seafarers Ministry out of the port of Oakland, Oakland, California. Thank you. And you know, a, a common one, connectivity is how you find him on, on the website. You know, very rarely do I get to interview uh, guests that have, and that's probably a third of the associations of which you're part of, right? You know, maybe my first question to you is obviously, welcome back uh, to Indonesia. Um, welcome to Bali. Look, what I'd love to go into with this interview with you is about, this is called Speak Up Monday, Destination Indonesia. We'll find you a chair, young lady. Destination in Indonesia. Now, we're here in this incredible nation because we have people tuning in from the US and all over the world. Indonesia is one of the most beautiful country in the world. It has about 17,000 plus islands, approaching 300 million people, one of the youngest populations, the earliest adopters of technology in the world, you know, de-globalization proof, right? They have a fertility rate that's growing. There will be, what, number four, uh, the fourth most populous country in the world, but will soon be uh, the fourth largest economy in the world within the next two or three decades. You know, and this is, again, about a third of what Indonesia brings to the table. So part of what we're going to be talking about tonight is, for those watching overseas, why should I come to Indonesia? Why should I come to Bali? That's one aspect that we're going to be going into. What is the business and culture of Indonesia? I know you've traveled extensively, which we'll get into. And also, you know, what kind of values, what kind of uh, less gems can you impart, you know, which add great value to those of us perhaps striving to become VPs or striving to become entrepreneurs or striving in our own businesses to do more, be more, to be greater, to contribute on a stronger, more powerful level. So that's probably the longest introduction I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, but listen, my brother, uh, in, when, I, when I ask you, you know, what is Indonesia to you, what comes up? So, first of all, uh, appreciate um, being here. Uh, appreciate everyone who's coming and those who are viewing now and those who will view later. Um, and I also want to thank um, the Indonesian um, society, government, I mean, I started in Jakarta. I've been here for a couple weeks in the country of Indonesia. So I've been to Indonesia before, but opted to spend more time here. So I was in Menteng in Jakarta, loved it. Uh, Surabaya, loved it. The call to prayer was so special. I've been around the world, but I've never been in a place where you got to hear the call to prayer as often. It was very special. And then this is my second time to Bali. I came here back in 2015, but I only came for two nights and maybe 30 hours. So I just bopped in and bopped out and didn't see anything. So this time I came in earlier and I went to, I think somebody said Kubu. So I spent a little time just straight, uh, straight north of the island uh, and just had coffee on the side of the terrace. But you asked about Indonesia. Um, you know, I've been trying to influence um, more Americans in general to vacation and do business outside of our typical comfort zone, which is the Caribbean, which is North America, which is Europe, and spend more time in what we call South-South countries. Those are countries around the equator and South. And there's just so much opportunity there. 
And what the ASEAN countries are doing over here is phenomenal, uh, which uh, Indonesia has been the lead and actually helped drive the creation of ASEAN. Um, so though Indonesia has always been on the radar, I just think Indonesia should be elevated even more so. Not just for business, I think there's a lot to learn from culture. The Smithsonian has uh, worked with Indonesia for, I mean, decades, uh, bringing Indonesian culture to Washington, D.C. and other places. So, um, you know, Smithsonian may be in the U.S., but it is actually, we view it as a research and museum for the whole world. Mm. You know, the, the value aspect, right? So we spoke about Indonesia, and by the way, uh, Rob's been retired for is it eight years? I, re I, uh, I retired at 50 years old, and I just turned uh, 58 this year. Yeah. So I walked away from everything when I turned 50. Yeah, and, and you know, the, the, the philanthropic... Um, but to do that, yeah. you got to build up your FU money, too. <laughs> if you want to learn about FU money, I'll charge you for it. But we <laughs> You know, the, one of the things which I think is really important, you know, getting straight into the value, you know, is you know, you've obviously had this eminent career, uh, which is still going, and we can get into some of the things that you're doing of late. But I think we spoke about this, uh, is it the seven C's, which I think is really powerful for those of us, you know, who are on the rise or who just want to kind of delve a little bit deeper into what, what are those finer points that will allow me give, to give me that springboard of understanding that gets me there in, in the, I wouldn't say the fastest possible way, but gets me there in a powerful way. Yeah, I... Um you know, people talk about control the controllables. Um, and there's a lot of things we have to solve within ourselves. Usually I talk about three. I expanded on the other the C's with him more than they usually do. But if you look at the core three of the C's, and I'll go into the other ones, chance, choice, and concentration. By chance, we are born where we are born to whom we are born to. You have no control of that, I have no control. We have no control who our parents are. We have no control what country we're born in. That is by chance, right? But there comes a time as we get a certain age, we have choice. And once we say we're an adult, the choices are ours. And if those who understand probability, probability, no choice is still, making no choice is still making a choice, right? So if you ever hear somebody says, I had no choices, and they did nothing, they made a choice, right? Voting and not voting is a choice. Not voting is you decided not, and that, I'm not saying it's bad or good, I'm just saying you made a choice to trust everybody else to represent you. Fine, okay. So chance, our parents are who our parents are. Once you get a certain age, you know, if you had not the best of time with your parents, Shake it away, you know what I mean? Um, you can't keep blaming them. But some people had great times, you know what I mean? And feel blessed that you had the great times, but feel blessed that you know your parents. Not everybody had that opportunity. And so chance, choice, concentration. A lot of people make choices, zero concentration. And they're constantly starting and stopping, starting and stopping, starting and stopping. And I'm not saying everybody has to stay at one firm like I did, but the point is make strategic choices, not emotional choices. A lot of people quit jobs because they don't like their boss. And what I used to tell people, I like, okay, well if you quit your job because you don't like your boss, guess what? They won. And what I learned over the years is and I learned this from my grandfather because he believes that like, if you're of good spirit, bad spirit people do not want to be around good spirit people. You know what I mean? So if you have a, and pick a religion, but the point is, if you really have a good spirit, you make people who don't really have a great spirit very uncomfortable. And my grandfather would sit next to people who would come to our church in Albany who would be disruptive, and he was a very quiet man, and he would sit right next to the disruptive drunk or whatever it was, and he's just calm. He wouldn't say anything to them. And they would calm down or they would leave and no longer be disruptive at the church, right? And so back to people quitting their bosses. I opted not to have my bosses make me quit. 
because I knew that I, was, I felt like I was a good person, but I also knew that either you're gonna learn to like me, I'll learn something about myself, or you'll have a heart attack and you gotta move on. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just blunt, right? So I wanted to get something out of it and I was not gonna let evil drive me out. You know, and obviously like uh, you're a brother of color, you know, and in the US, you know, this is a, not a deep question, but it gets, it gets to it. So you've managed well, to I do... Well, look pretty big on camera. Well, I, I got know. some work to do. <laughs> you know... I so got triplets here. Your triplets? <laughs> so, all good. So, you know, what would you say? Because, I mean, you mentioned there about quitting your boss, and I know you had 14 assignments and so on, and so you're a person who, in your career on the way up... Now, this is regardless of whichever ism, sexism, classism, racism, sexism, whatever it might be, but, you know, how did you uh, go through and be still inspired to keep going, to, to keep striving to reach where you, where you did? Um, well, there's a couple of things. Uh, associations. A lot of us leave a lot of things on the table, right? And when you're not born into it, I'm not, you know, if you're not born into whatever name it is, whatever country you're in, then you have to create those things. And I think a lot of people leave, everybody searches for a network, but they leave their network on the table. And I knew from a young age that my associations mattered and they opened up doors for me that I never knew. Because most people chase that one-ism, but I knew that if I had information, because I chased information which gave me avenues that I never imagined, right? So I stayed connected with people I went to high school with. I stayed connected with people I worked in, uh, or, uh, uh, I went to college with. I stayed contact, I'm still in contact with the first job I had at a veterinarian that I worked in high school from 15 to 16 years, Dr. Luane Dunaway, because I wanted to be a vet, which I opted not to, but I'm still in touch. I still write 50 to 100 minimum letters, handwritten letters a year to various people associations. So there's a lot of people chasing that. Former employers. The first thing when somebody comes to me and they want to tap into my network, I ask a simple question. What about your associations? How are they? Number two, what would your former employer say about you? Every last one of my former employers have positive things to say about me. And my, my dad said it when I used to work for him at the construction site. He used to say, Bob, Master the assignment that I gave you and then learn what everybody else does that plugs into what you do. And there's so many people, they just go, I'm just a salesperson, I'm just information, I'm just programming, and they only do their own. But he goes, understand what plugs into what you do. And that made me bigger than what I ever imagined. You know, and which created a demand. So the question yeah. becomes, your associations, how you leverage them, you create a demand in, it's all about what you solve. People don't pay you because they like you. And usually I ask people, like, what do you solve? Mm. If you can't tell me in a couple of seconds what you solve, then let's just have coffee and a beer because we don't need to talk about anything else. Mm. And as a alliteration to that, I remember a story about, about how uh, you were invited to the Smithsonian so maybe, I think that's a great alliteration to the story of, yeah. So, for my university, Indiana University, I take hot calls from anyone. So if you have a, um, if you have a question about a career, uh, people go, call Robert. And so there's this one time somebody called me and said, well, they said I was, you know, they, I told them I was interested in going into the food and beverage consumer products industry. And they said, well, call Robert Johnson because they were considering doing a master's degree. And so I took the call. Well, this person happened to be on contract at the Smithsonian a decade and a half ago. And I said, well, before you tell me what you want to do, tell me what you have done and what you are doing. Because I don't care what you want to do. I need to understand what you've already done. And so I found out what they were doing, and that got me introduced to the Smithsonian, and I've been connected to the staff and a lot of the other people for a decade and a half because even though I sit on the board, I take an interest in the staff and other people at the Smithsonian. So for, you know, if you show up enough, people go, hey, how about you become a board member, you know? And so that's in DC. And so there's not a board, 
And if you go to acommononeconnectivity.com, acommononeconnectivity.com, there's not a board that I have been on that I pursued. And then I worked at Kraft Foods and Procter & Gamble. I did not ask to pursue a job at Procter & Gamble. I was recommended by the deans to interview with Procter & Gamble, which is a multi-billion dollar company, because when I was a student, I was creating programs for undergraduates to talk to seniors to understand what degree they should go to because not everybody have parents they can talk to. And I was using my own money to pay for those programs, which got me noticed. So when you're doing, you'd be amazed who's looking. So that gave me, pro I got hired at Procter & Gamble before I graduated. Think about that. And I made more than my mom and dad combined. I felt guilty. And then, I mean, think about that. That's a, like a heavy guilt. And I got a company car? You should have seen it. So when they said, like, they go, hey, Mr. John, they hired me on the first interview. I go, I don't want to work for you. The dean made me come. <laughs> you know, because, and I didn't, most people, think about when most people go to an interview, guess what they show up with? They show up with a tablet and their resume. Everybody does. I didn't do that. I had always collected and quantified everything that I did. And I showed up with a portfolio. And whenever they said, I said, well, I was with my fraternity, Alpha Phi Alpha. I helped drive this program. You know, they used to get this amount of people come in. We raised the price and generated this. And I started taking them through all these different things. They're like, you quantified over there? Like, you're hired. If you take this test and you're not that stupid, we'll tell you, we'll take you. So anyway, so I got her. And then, at, uh, when I was in Louisville, Kentucky, working for Procter & Gamble, and I'm, t I'm talking about associations and when you're doing how you get noticed, Kraft Foods heard about me. Well, they weren't even a direct competitor to Procter & Gamble, but what happened is when I was at PNG in Kentucky, there was a lot of people who were quitting, and I didn't complain, so I would work during the day, and then I would start again at 9 p.m. when some of the leadership of our clients were coming in, and I'd work in the evening, right? Well, when everyone was quitting, then the data that came in the marketplace, guess who got the credit for all the data in the marketplace when the market share was growing? Proctor didn't notice it, but other people noticed it that were my competitors and other people. And then I got, I was 26 years old and they flew me to uh, New York and I'd never been flown and they wine and dine me. And then they go, you're hired. They interviewed me on a Friday and gave me an offer on a Monday and they gave me like 35% more than what I was making. I'm like, Okay, so if you're doing, you'd be amazed at who will invest in you if you're solving something, and I hope that helps. But the associations in doing, it started with me using my own money, I'm out of state, and I'm like, these other people, I knew what I want to do, but there's a lot of other people who could benefit from graduate students, other people talking about lives and opportunities, and I got noticed. You know, one of the... The, the beautiful, by the way, you've got some water here if you need it at any point. One of the great things I love about your story, right, is that you mentioned already, you know, the, this willing, willingness to learn, willingness to solve problems. These three C's, seven C's, you, you, get, you gave us three, but there's seven of them, yeah. right? Um, managing those uh, thin threads, I call them, right? Those thin threads that lead back to your past. But when you pull a thread, often many other things come with it, like the roots of a tree. Like the roots give you your fruits, right? And the one over here, remember, our seeds. Our seeds are our deeds. And, and our, our deeds, deeds are, are our seeds. seeds, right? And so when people want to either help, ask me to help them get a job or they're trying to get uh, promoted, before I go, to go, well, tell me what your seeds are and tell me what your deeds are. Tell me who you celebrate, not who you want to celebrate you, and tell me who you support. Mm. And if it's all about you, then why would I? For me, I, I believe in the greater good, so I will invest my time mm. into people I think that are doing the greater good for others, and their actual seeds are what they do. It's not about your money, right? It's like, when you listen to people, ask somebody, who do you celebrate? Right? And if they only talk about their boss, but they don't notice their coworker that like stays up with them at the office or various other places or will take the call to bounce an idea off of, that tells you something about them. A true team player doesn't just recognize the identified superstar because the identified superstar isn't always the best. They may have the karma. 
But if you want to make the world a better place, find the people who celebrate good people, and then we'll make it all better. You know, the and thing, I learned that from my mom. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I love that. So here's the thing, right? So, you know, what people don't know until you check out his website, right? A common one, connectivity.com, is, you know, the people that you've hung out with, continue to visit in your retirement, right? Retirement, but you're still working. Because uh, you'll never retire, man. Let's be honest. It's uh, a new set of tires. New, really. new set of tires. I love that. Got that Made a little note, new set of tires. You know, like we're talking heads of state. We're talking like uh, go as high up the tree as you want to as low as the tree as you want. Now, here's the thing. So you call yourself a commoner, mm -hmm. right? So maybe if you can explain that to the people here that they see a person before them who's achieved these things, but still yet all of that calls himself a commoner. Why? Um, first, I do have a common name, Robert Johnson. The Robert N. is different. <laughs> but um, understanding ourselves, like some people were born with a level of karma that people naturally follow, right? Some people um, work really hard to get people to have them follow. And then also sometimes just observe how people treat you when you step into a room, right? And I know from an early age that I've always been a commoner regardless of what I achieve by virtue of when I step into, regardless of the type of room, how I'm treated. Because I don't, people have no idea what I've been a part of. They have no idea of any of that other stuff, which is great because we are traveling in certain places to keep you from getting kidnapped. But anyway, <laughs> they're like, hey, he's just a black guy riding a horse in Argentina. Okay. <laughs> Take the horse. Okay with me. Yeah, take the horse. <laughs> Leave the guy. Take Leave the, the guy. Take the horse. Leave him in the pampas. <laughs> so anyway, so there's benefits to it. But the point is, it, it may, that means it makes associations even more important. And so that means those of us who are natural commoners, regardless of what we've accomplished, have to at times step out of our comfort zone to be more assertive than we're really uh, comfortable with because the environment makes us do that or we're gonna be run over, you know? I would like to be a very easygoing person and I come into a room and I'm just like, oh, I'll be treated like everyone else. But then some people are like, oh, no, you need to be there or why are you here? I remember, I'll give you an example. I, uh, had this, I was at a part of a, um, um, a keynote speaker before dinner in uh, China, all right? Beijing, China. Chocolate. I call myself a chocolate Forrest Gump, right? So, <laughs> chocolate Forrest Gump. If you know what Forrest Gump is, right? yeah. Come and grab a seat, darling. Yeah. yeah. So, I'm supposed to give the speech. A guy from a major sports network is to introduce me. I speak the Queen's English. There's only certain ways that I greet people another way, and that's only if I really know you and your family. Otherwise, it is a Queen's English and a gentleman's handshake. This gentleman, we're in a formal thing. I'm in my Mandarin, well, look, my seamstress, Connie Wong, 25 years, Singapore, she's my auntie. So anyway, I'm in my custom thing. I show up there, the guy comes up to me and goes, hey man, what's up, dude? And I'm in this all formal, you guys. And it was just so insulting to me. So again, I'm a commoner. I'm, to be one of the key speakers before the dinner, and this guy who's the only other American that's in that back room, well, there might be another, but he greets me like too comfortable, and it was very uncomfortable for me. You see what I mean? And when you're in certain societies and you're trying to, I mean, it's about respect and dignity, that was probably the most undignified moment, and then I had to go out and perform on stage, which I did, right? And I didn't say anything to him, but what I did do, because my mom told me, you know, when somebody treats you bad, you don't always say something at that moment because it's not our job to train them. Destiny will do that. But what I did is, I went back to the organization that hosted the event, and I said, I'm gonna tell you this story, all right? Because you guys say your mission is the following things. And this gentleman did something that was not a part of your mission, and I don't think it was very dignified. And they said, we will never hire or recommend that person again. That individual has no idea that that's been done. 
And so for years, I try to be just natural and nice, but there's always somebody just trying to like, you know, tried to knock me off my game. There's like 500, 600 people in that room I was gonna to speak to at that dinner. But those in the audience never know. You can't let somebody else's treatment of you drive your emotions. But you need to document and follow through so something gets on their record. <laughs> I love that. So uh, I'm Game of Thrones, like I said. Oh, no, you, you got that. You're, you're, we're, this, is multi, Ninja. this is multi-dimensional chess. I am a rook, <laughs> not a knight, not a bishop because I'm not that religious, and I'm never be a queen or king because they're too important. So I'm just a rook. <laughs> <laughs> so look, we're, we've got a few more things that I want to cover, and then we're going to go to you, the audience. If you have, this, if you have I any have a question. Is this valuable, or I mean, is it He's interesting? Asking. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right. So after that, they're going to get their chance, right? So there'll be a third mic. It's all good. Coming to you. So if you have a question, remember, uh, that question will be on camera. Uh, if you want another question more of a more private nature, you can wait till afterwards, right? Okay. So uh, again, I'm, what I'm not trying to do, but what's coming through is this, before we get on to Indonesia and why uh, the people watching should come, um, uh, the last bit I want to touch upon of the value aspect of our conversation Tell us and tell them about the 168, because I think that's really valuable, a valuable reminder for people that, again, the choice part of those three Cs of seven that you explained before. Yeah. So um, when you look at, uh, okay, let me just tell you the seven Cs. I gave you the three. Chance, choice, and concentration, okay? And I... And, then after that, curiosity. Choice without curiosity means you're going to do the same thing over and over. And then curiosity without concentration means you're going to do the same thing over and over again, right? Um, competition. And then compassion. So chance, choice, concentration, curiosity, and if you're in some place that's important, there's going to be competition. Just be, just be ready for it, right? And then learn to have compassion, because compassion is your associates and who you celebrate. And they will celebrate and uplift you, too. And then guess what that leads to in the, in the end? Compensation. Cha-ching. Chance, choice, concentration, curiosity, competition, Compassion equals compensation in my world. So look. Oh, so and then yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get and to wait that. real quick. Yeah, go. The, the key thing that uh, he, what he's talking about is another thing I talk to talk about, and I usually don't talk. Usually, if I master chat, I usually don't do many public type of things like these. Uh, and I've only done like or spoken to one high school, and usually I don't speak to students in a broader sense. Maybe collegiate, not high school. But what I did share with this one school was what I call 168. Because everybody, I was taught, like my fraternity did, excuses, excuses are monumental nothings that lead to nowhere. Those who use these tools of incompetence are masters of nothing. You know? So everybody has the same thing. We've always, there's so many people who focus on what they don't have, but guess what we all have? We all have 168 hours a week. 168 hours a week. And when people tell me they don't have any time, I go, because we went through that. And I went through with one of your friends the other day, and I said, 168 hours. If I gave you 10 hours of sleep a day, you still got a lot of hours. What are you doing with your hours? And how does your choices and your concentration fit into that? Before you complain about anybody else, how are you using your 168? Love it. And look, uh, maybe after we'll go, if you were here for longer, we're doing like a special masterclass on 168 and, and how, you know, when you take out 10 hours of sleep and there's a sequential order to it, you end up with about 48 to 50 hours. And this is, this is the place and the time that those 48 to 50 hours determine who you become. <laughs> That's what it comes down to, but we can do that uh, on another occasion. So for those of you just joining us now uh, online, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, 
So today is episode number 400 of Speak Up Monday, Destination Indonesia. Our guest is Robert N. Johnson, a former vice president of a multi-billion dollar company called Kraft. And again, the, we'll go through this again. The associations from Smithsonian, Kraft Foods, Procter & Gamble, Indiana University, Adelante Foundation in, in Honduras, the Seafarers Ministry at the Port of Oakland, California, and, and so, so, so much more. But look, one of the questions that's coming through, and after this, in the audience, you will have your chance to ask a question. So we'll have that microphone um, ready. So tell us more about your impression of Indonesia. So when I, when I say to you, you, know, you, you spoke about it before, about you would like more people to see Indonesia, how it truly is, not what they think it is. So if you're speaking now to some people which are maybe in the States, in the UK, or somewhere else saying, you know, I've heard about this Indonesia place. I've heard it's going to be maybe the fourth largest economy in, in a couple of decades. I've heard that it printed no money during COVID. So its economy is deglobalization proof. It has one of the highest growth rates, it's most stability uh, in the world. I understand that Southeast Asia is in a pocket where the US, Europe, and so on are going through some challenges that will take maybe a while to get to the other side of. So it's a great place to be from that perspective, right? So without leading you too much, uh, yeah, so what would you say to someone who said, hey, Indonesia, what's your impression of it? Why should we go? And what can we do there? Uh, I, there's a couple of things. It, it goes back to one of the C's, curiosity, right? And then back to time, choice. And it depends if you're talking leisure, if you're talking business. If you're talking um, business, I would recommend that you, if you're an entrepreneur, like if right now we're at the, um, uh, what is it, Tropical Nomad, right? Which is a beautiful spot and it's well done. And places like these really need to get more attention because there's a lot of opportunity here for activity like this, there's also a lot of opportunity for corporations and firms, not just startups, to spend time here. Not everything always needs to be centrally located where you currently are, you know what I mean? And you, get, you might get a different vibe that may help you drive your business, number one. Number two, tourist-wise, I was blown away as I walked the streets of Mintang and parts of Jakarta and Surabaya. I didn't see many Americans, if any, you know what I mean, or North Americans in general. Um, and the challenge for a lot of North Americans, uh, Canadians do a great job of traveling all over the place, but I would recommend in the US, spread your wings. The countries at the equator and south are where we should be, not only for um, tourism, but for business opportunities. If you have a niche small business, you never know. You could do some of the manufacturing here. It doesn't always have to be where some of the other people have been outsourcing for years, right? Get to know the government. They have consulates in all the different countries. And the thing is, back to the 168, there's so many things free in a lot of our countries that all we need to do is just show up. You have um, the, the different consulates in a lot of countries. They host socials. They host annual events, uh, you know, just show up to those things. Um, and you never know the network that you build from that. And that may help you with your entrepreneurial idea, may help you with your vacation idea. Now for US, a lot of people go, oh, it's so far to travel. It, set that aside if you really are seeking opportunity. The world would not be as advanced as it is today if we had not had people for centuries who, didn't, who opted to step outside of their village, their community, and et cetera, period. So here's what I used to say to my competition. I didn't say to my competition, I said to myself, if you don't have the imagination to go where the opportunities are, I'm okay, because I'm gonna make the money you aren't. So if you don't have the backbone to step out your comfort zone to go, I'm okay because there's gonna be people like me and others that are gonna say, Indonesia? I'm gonna look into that. And oh, by the way, and like a lot of people go, well, I can't afford it. Again, excuse. You got libraries that are free, read up on it, right? You got the internet, read up on it. You know, it's, it blows my mind. People, when they're really interested in something, 
they will give it the time. And if you're really interested in building yourself and becoming not only domestic but international, the one thing I learned early on is I always felt like I had to be bigger than the organizations that I worked for. I had to be bigger than the organizations I worked for. But that also meant that I was the organization that I worked for. I was never one of those people like, oh, that co my company sucks. I stayed away from those people. I was Mr. Kraft Foods to people. They're like, that guy loves Kraft Foods. I was going to wear my Indiana hat. You know, I'm, a, I'm on the uh, Dean's Advisory Board for the International Global Studies for uh, Hamilton Luger. You know, I'm on the IU Foundation. We over, have oversight of $3.5 billion um, uh, endowment. So... Some of us have a lot of things on our radar screen, and, you, and here's what I would ask you as we talk about a commoner, and you're 168. You might be amazed that the person who you think is common, or the person who isn't flashy, and the person who's not on the agenda is not connected or nobody, then you messed up. I've always believed when I go to anything, if I don't exit, depending on the size of the event, if I do not exit with five people that I got to meet, I view the event was a failure, any event. And I'm talking about a real decent conversation. I'm not saying business has to transact from that, but I view it as a failure. And I don't wait for people to hunt me down. And I've done that my, I've been doing that since high school. And you'd be away, the internet, the social media, what it's done for me, I used to do handwritten letters, which I still do, and email, which I still do, but I do every social media thing, what that has done is allowed me to keep my relationships hot. So my example, how I got even more embedded with Indi or got to know Indonesia better was through my university. We had a, a Asia event in Bali that I only came for two days, but I was on the advisory board, I was on the board for the Alumni Association. How I came to Jakarta, they were doing an event in Jakarta and I was invited and I said, okay, and then I told you, and we like tied it all in together. So our associations lead to, I can't even, I can't tell you unless I have you all sign a non-disclosure act for the rest of your life, but the opportunities you have just through associations, and they're at your fingertips. They're at your fingertips. I used to interview people, and I would recommend you never do an interview this way. Never talk down to the job that you had. Never talk down to the job that your parents had. Because the person at the other side of the table is making an assessment of can you deliver and what can you bring to my organization. And if you go, I was just a waitress. I was just a bartender. I was just a stalker. I was just bad groceries. I was just a farmer you have not translated to them why they should want you. When, when Procter & Gamble interviewed me, I was working at a library. Uh, I worked at a, a grocery store um, that I had been working for five years, and I drove a truck, because I, I was paying my own way, right? And I didn't just do those jobs, I understand why they needed to be done, right? And so me, instead of me saying, oh, I just bag groceries and stock, uh, stock grocers and grocery store, I said, look, these are, the, these are the peak business periods. This is how we handle the consumers. This is customer services. I didn't know. Nobody taught me that. I just knew how, maybe through Sesame Street or something, but I, I just learned uh, count, the count was my favorite. Ah, ah, ah. But anyway, yeah, so, um, if you guys don't know Sesame Street, there was a guy called Count. But anyway, but how you value you will determine how other people value you. Man, that's, uh, that is a juice right there. I'm just going to quickly go, IU, we need the microphone, right? Because I promised everybody uh, an opportunity to ask questions. So, Guz, you got it. So, questions. I know there's some over here. Just raise a hand. The microphone will come to you. All right? Or over here. Over there. Here. Whichever one, man. Work it out, you people. All right. Cool. So, um, Again, for those of you just tuning in, so you're watching uh, Speak Up Monday, episode number 400. When we reach 500, I'm going to have a big party. When we reach 1,000, it's going to be a huge party. Uh, and I, I love the fact that we're at 400. And what I haven't mentioned is that Rob and I, uh, we met, anyone here remember an app called Clubhouse? Raise your hand if you know what Clubhouse is or was. 
Raise your hand if you have no idea what Clubhouse is. Great. So Rob's going to try and interrupt me, but it's not going to work this time. Clubhouse is like a, a it, it kind of reached meteoric success during COVID. It's a vocal only app. So in other words, it's before Twitter Spaces, right? It was the one, yeah? So you can basically log into this app and it's about people's voices. You have different rooms like a curated feed on Facebook, which, you, which when you sign up for your account, you, you basically create what it is you want to hear about, which you would never get the chance to speak to ever, probably in your life, but you did get this chance then. So this thing had millions of people involved. And these rooms, as they're called, had anything from, well, you could have a room with, with one person, yourself, if you really wanted to, up to thousands of people at once. And it was phenomenal. So for those of you who don't realize, so Speak Up Monday, this one, right, after this, I would go Tuesday morning, right, it's still Monday in the U.S., so I would do a Speak Up Monday, different content, different uh, guests to the U.S. market, right? I met this guy, Rob. I met um, Teja Valenza, who's this Emmy Award-winning actress, the Hollywood actress who's just killing the game. But so many people of great value I found on this app where, where you didn't even see their face, it's just their voice. Now, this man kept coming in every now and again, and he would just drop these nuggets of value, that would kind of knock your socks off, right? I use other words, but that one is, is, is P, PG, right? Knock your socks off. And I'd be like, who is this guy? He just keeps coming in every now and again and boom, like a, like a one-two, right? So I found out his name was Robert Johnson, N. Johnson, Robert N. Johnson, right? And then we just kind of got talking, you know, like outside of the clubhouse ecosystem, maybe on Instagram and so on. And because he's retired and travels around, you know, we, we had this opportunity about a year or so ago uh, to, to kind of cross paths and didn't quite happen. And then to my delight, um, some months ago, he's like, Rob, I'm coming back. Remember, we had never met in person uh, and so that's what I mean you know like the thin threads that you spoke about earlier on about who is your network right who is your association right those, those thin threads looking back from what you've just said have given me so many opportunities it's not who you know but who knows you just let that sit it's not who you know but who knows you and there are so many people who don't know you know you, but have seen you, have ingested your content, and so on and so on and so on. And this is what's happened. It's created opportunities in the years later that actually came. So, so yeah, just want to quickly put that in before we go to the question. The uh, question is with who? Who's got the microphone? There. Okay. Bhavna. Hi. Well, first off, congratulations, Brother Rob. 400 episodes is absolutely incredible and a testament to showing up for the last four years. Without missing one, huh? Exactly. And we, 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 will, we will not. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so my question is, Robert, um, that you've clearly been on probably many boardrooms in the corporate environment, in CPG, being at Kraft, and I imagine you would have heard a lot of reasons from clients or business reasons to not do something or to not move forward. And I'm curious if... As a board member, so I just want to clarify that, right? Because the actual private corporate board of craft, they did not have commoners like me there. Just going to be very blunt. You know what I mean? And, and, um, and so even when sometimes they were walking the halls, they would be like, I mean, you would think that board of directors would want a mixing mingle. You said this is PNG, PG? Okay, I have no, to No, no PG, but let it go. Let it go. Mm. They wouldn't fucking mingle. So, I mean, you know what I mean? So, I, to get to your question is, I'm kind of skipping your question, but that kind of answers your question, right? Because you have a lot answers your question, right? Because... You have a, a number of people on these boards, my opinion, because many of them end up recycling themselves. Because once you get on one or two paid corporate boards, you get added to because it becomes a fraternity sorority that you wouldn't believe. And if you knew the money that they made on these things, blow your mind away for only three to four meetings a year, hundreds of thousands of dollars. That doesn't include options. So, I would say, how about I give boards advice? If you're gonna be on a board, 
How about you get to know the employees? Don't be scared of them. You know? We, you get, we got these organizations that said our people are our valued asset. And then they go, our shareholders are. They always hide behind their shareholders. But I would say what I view as a good board and a good company with a good culture is a board that is not afraid to actually interface with the employees and the leadership that is comfortable being in the same dining room as their employees. Now, we did have that. Beautiful question. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. So next one was where? Question, question. Over here. Yeah. So, uh, Carol. Yeah. So if you're tuning in, everybody, welcome. Speak well, up Monday. I'm pass it to Mike um, real right, quick. I just want to give a shout out to my parents in heaven, John, John Johnson Sr., Gloria Johnson. Um, they were awesome. And... Uh, we have a couple hundred years documented of uh, being in the U.S., so we contributed to our country, and we take pride in that. We don't let anybody diminish what we contributed to our country. And contributing to our country helped contribute to the world. And then, most importantly, my best bud, talk about thin line of associations, my bodyguard, my rock, my love, my wife, Trin, um, by chance, and, and the associations. You never know what happens. Vietnamese American. So I was going to ask you a completely different question, but now that you've mentioned your wife, um, what are the top three qualities of an amazing wife, of a CEO or an executive, someone who has a career path like yours? Be the second one? <laughs> I, I mean, I'm joking, but I'm serious. Um, you know, he, what's so funny is, and that's like anybody, because at the end of the day, when you, first, when you first get married when you're young, you marry, it's, sometimes it can be like a business agreement. You're a good person, I'm a good person, we're going to do great. But you're working hard, and then over time, somebody may not like you anymore because you're working hard, right? And when you get a certain age, destiny provides you, you know, somebody decides to leave you, fine. My family is like, you can't keep somebody. If they want to walk away from you, walk away, all right? And that opened up my opportunity for me to be with my wife, Trin. My daughter and I actually met my wife at the same time, December, 15 years ago, this week. And I was on crutches. And my daughter, who was about seven years old at the time for my first marriage, she goes, Daddy, I'm concerned about you being in California by yourself. You need somebody to watch movies with. And she said, what about that lady we met at that Christmas social who came in? And I go, well, you know, Daddy's like a nerd. I mean, it doesn't work like that. And she goes, just try. We've been together ever since. My mother loved her. My mother was, my mother had never given me advice in my whole life <laughs> on relationships. And it came a time, she's like, you've been dating this woman forever. I got her, I was taping my mother because I started audio taping my mom. And she comes out of nowhere, my, my daughter, my sis, youngest sister, my mom, and my daughter, my mom, very silent woman, silent Southern Arkansas woman. She says, Robert, we like Trin. Your daughter likes Trin. And then my mom goes, marry her. <laughs> And this is a soft-spoken Southern woman. So anyway, does that it? So I think the thing is, it depends, you know? And sometimes, I think some people have people, we, we all change over time and nothing's forever, but have someone that is as comfortable as they are with themselves, maybe as busy as they are with themselves, um, someone that you also uplift, you know, because it can't all be about you, you know what I mean? And there's a balance. We're like yin and yang, literally, you know? And then if you can't, if you have to be embarrassed by natural biological functions with your spouse, then you don't need to be with them. I'm just joking, but I'm serious, right? So technically, if there's somebody who's really your soulmate and your partner, you should be able to fall down. Some certain things should happen. They should not be embarrassed by you. It's just like natural. 
And um, I found that in my wife. And my daughter picked her for me. Thank you. That's beautiful. Can I have one, one more? We all knew the second one was coming. Yeah. It's okay. Go for it. Um, so I meet a lot of men who are chasing their dream here in Bali um, and who look at having a relationship as something that actually competes with their dream of building a business and being very successful. Uh, it is my opinion that actually having a relationship is something that is very uplifting and, and helps you getting, getting to, uh, to a higher place and create much more. So what would you say to these men in order for them to realize that actually this is, this is a good thing? 168. <laughs> how you use your time and how they're using your time. But the big thing is, you, you know, when, when I was, uh, used to call my mom, my mom allocated only so many minutes for each kid, right? Because mom and dad had like, there were seven of us total, right? And... I would say, well, John's not doing this, or Rita's not doing it, and mom would be like, ah, let's just talk about the good stuff. And so she, what she was trying to say is, find the gratitude and the good. And so what I would recommend for, let's say the men, or whoever's, not just men, whoever's really working really hard to try and climb, is If you can find someone, or they find you, and I don't really think you need to search, but if, if you can find a set of people or a person who celebrates you as much as you celebrate them, you got to keep her. You got to keep her. You know what I mean? And um, you have to be as good when you're at the top of your game <coughs> than when you fall. And it's better for you to be generous And kind, being kind costs nothing. And honestly, if, if any of us can't find somebody who appreciates us and they're not kind, as my mom said, it's better to be by yourself. Boom. Just be happy. Yeah. Question? Okay, my brother. Um, Wait, before you ask the question, what chess piece are you? Depends on who I'm playing. All right, when you're trying to make money. I'm often the knight. Knight or, knight or bishop. It's funny he's, that you're admitting that you're part psychic because I was going to ask about the rook um, because I don't look at the, I look at the rook as an overlooked piece because he's very, very powerful in what he commands. He commands a line, you know, and he commands a square. He, he, he's the cornerstone of whatever line he's on. So he's not like a common piece. He often doesn't get brought into the game until later to move into the ending games. He's not in the, mid, in, in the beginning or mid games. So I was, my first question was, with that being said about the Rook and the way I look at it, why would you consider yourself, just go a little more into that piece of the Rook, you know what I'm saying, for, for yourself? So for those of you, we're talking about chess. And usually I play multi-dimensional mental chess. Mm -hmm. So right now we're just talking about a flat plane board, right? So usually, like, but anyway, so a rook can move straight and it can move sideways. It can only move like this way, no diagonal. Bishop can move diagonal. Knight can move um, well, yeah, like an L, you know? Pawns can go one spot or forward. They can attack diagonal. So things like that, so you understand that. So the rook usually isn't the first one played because it can't be played. The knight can jump over a pawn and a lot of our organizations have knights and a lot of those knights aren't always the nicest people in the world too because they're always jumping over the pawns and they treat them like shit. And I've worked with a lot of people. And when I retired, one of my, I have three rules. I only work with good people who do good things for others. Deeds are their seeds and then highly competitive people. But the last one, I can no longer make assholes millionaires. Because mm. you can have somebody who's legal, but they're an ass. They're, they're legal, but not ethical. They're legal, but not nice. They're legal, but they only celebrate themselves. And so the knight jumps everywhere, right? The, the queen, I, I will never be as important as a queen and king, but what the rook can do, what happens when the queen, or when the king needs somebody? 
he castles with his boy. Exactly. Can he castle with anybody else? Nope. Exactly. So I made a career of going through the problem where nobody else wanted to go where you possibly could have been fired. If you go where every... I'm so common. If I went where everybody went, I wouldn't be noticed and nobody wanted it. So I had to go where other people didn't want to go and make it sexy. And so I'm a rook. And so... And the other thing is, think about this. Who is your, who is your best marketer of yourself? And then who is the worst marketer of yourself? You. And most of us will not share things about ourselves because we're like, ooh, I'm going to look like I want it too much or I'm talking about myself too much. But I'm like, my mom used to say, if they're going to hate you because of that, they're going to hate you when you don't do it. So why not do it, right? And so if you look at my website, like a lot of people tell you what they can do, right? I show you the awards that I've gotten, the industry awards, the diamonds for being on the top at the company, the awards from the clients, you know. And, you know so I would, uh, here's what I would recommend you guys do, and this is as a rook, the reason I'm giving an example of rook. Rooks don't get noticed until they have to be noticed. And that's been my whole life. That's very cold. Goosebumps. Yes. My uh, second piece is back to the FU money. So um, here in Bali, in uh, Digital Nomads, um, there are more entrepreneurs and business owners than there are employees who are thinking about, I would just say that um, business owners and entrepreneurs think more about FU money and are closer to FU money than employees. And then you said, hey, man, at 50, half a century... I was out of there. Then you said, but you got to have F you money first. So you came in like a business owner and an entrepreneur, a current with an exit strategy. I knew nobody would be loyal to me. So I had to be loyal to me. You're going to have to go into that. What do you mean you knew nobody would be loyal so to you? So when you start your career, who cares about you? Think about this. Who wants to make any of us a millionaire? I know a lot of people get sold by these people who sell these books and go, hey, if you read my book, you'll be a millionaire. I'll show you. Next time, ask them a question. How did you make your first million? And you'll find out they made their first million selling you on how to be a millionaire through their books on how to be a millionaire. I wouldn't take advice from those people. You need to take advice from somebody who actually took their time and figured it out. Because lightning only strikes so often, so you got to think it through, right? So when you think about it is early on, you got to listen to people. When I was in Louisville, Kentucky, um, working in the South there, some of the old um, clients would say in their old voice, they go, young man, when you get your bonus, make sure you put half of it away or save it all because guess what it's called? They go, it's called a bonus. It's not a guarantee. Mm. It's called a bonus, not a guarantee. There are so many people who live into their bonus and there's so many people who live into their credit. So you, if you start the right way, and then my grandma used to say, uh, Grandma Lou, uh, she's from Mississippi, she goes, um, baby, you can have your dreams, but do not make your dreams my nightmare. You can have your dreams, but do not make your dreams my nightmare. So think of all the people who, who are trying to do something, and they get upset with their friends because their friends don't want to give them money for it. It's not your fault. So, if you want to get your F you money, be around friends that don't get upset when you don't give them your money. And my mother was like, don't loan money. Don't beg for it, don't loan for it. But if you solve something that the consumer wants or somebody wants, people will want to put the money behind you. But your associations give you the foundation. And so many people leave their associations on the table. Your school your former high school teacher, your coach. Your and the thing is, sometimes you need cheerleaders, and those are our free cheerleaders. So people go and pay for a coach. They, pay for, they go to the priest. Well, you got coaches all around you who've been saying great things about you, and they don't always have to be in your business. Sometimes you just need somebody that says, I like you, and you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. 
to your heart's desire if you can do it in your imagination then you can do it in real life the root word of imagination is magi which is the root word of magic um, you answered my the, the end of the question because I was going to say, what about an entrepreneur versus a person who works with somebody else? But no, your, do what you your do. Your answer was just like, yo, don't leave associations on the table. Right. Thank you. Exactly. And then you can understand branding. Did you hear that motorcycle? Yes. All right. We have an idea what it is. A Harley. Yeah. Well, usually I don't give free advertising like my that. My bad. All right. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Harley, you need to pay us. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway, the point is when you create associations, I would ask you if I see you in a year from now, when you make a noise, what does somebody think about you? Like, what are you known for? What, what do you solve? What is your Harley sound? It don't have to be loud. It could be a whimper, but it is a sound that somebody hears. So what are you known for? And when you're known for something, you'd be a... Look, I had, prince, I had tea with the princess of Thailand. I showed you the picture. It's on my website. So anything that I tell you, like a lot of people tell you things, I give you a visual aid of when it happened and where it happened, right? Raised in upstate New York, raised in Missouri, commoner, ends up having tea with the princess of Thailand whose mentor was a part of the Thai royal family. Hello, how does that happen? associations doing you all can do it and you can build your fu money by how you balance those things too but just be around good people who celebrate you too and find the right people to celebrate and when you need money don't give up your soul because if you really got something that can solve something see here's what drives me crazy a number of you great entrepreneurs come up with these great ideas and there's a lot of people who are listening to what you're doing and they may even talk to you, and they will take your idea, and tweak it a bit, and blow it out, and they'll never come back to you and say thank you. They'll never come back and add you back. Or they may say thank you, but they wouldn't. They'd be like, well, hey, you know what? I'm making five billion right now. I know you were there in Tropical Nomad with me, but thanks for the coffee, <laughs> you know? I would ask that as you come along, remember those not the coaches, but your other players that were seated next to you when you were programming or doing something that you could bounce ideas off of. You know, the, that's a beautiful point. We're going to be closing soon, but, but here, here's the thing. So this is about, as you said, visual aids, right? Alliterating a story so you really get it. So we had a chat about the tech guys, right? And just what you just said last about, you know, it's the closeness so if you could give that as an example, I think that will really seal it. So I read a lot, and I would recommend people do the same thing, right? Um, read what you want, but read. But how you read matters. So a lot of people read a biography to understand the individual. The way I read biographies, to understand their ecosystem around them. Who were their parents? Who were their friends? Who gave them the chance? And then I do a deeper dive on who gave them a chance. So for example, in the US, everybody likes General Eisenhower. Well, General Eisenhower during World War II, he was one of the generals in the uh, European theater. He had no battlefield experience before he was elevated to be over a major theater. None. But Roosevelt and General Marshall grabbed him from way below and pulled him above a lot of other people. All right? Now that's not the tech thing, but I'm giving you an example. Sometimes you can be an amazing leader in areas that aren't exactly, you don't exactly, he had the administrative stuff, he had the staff. He didn't have like the boom bang, all that other stuff, but they knew he knew how to get the other people who could do it, right? So, example, so when you read a biography, so if you read about, I'm not even gonna say his name, but one of these tech people, you'll find that the people they surrounded themselves sometimes had psychology degrees, art history degrees, HR, something like that. And what they ended up doing is, they may have, but they had somebody who had their mic. 
they may have the tech, but they had somebody who could communicate it in a way that they did not have the capability to. And a lot of times, if you look at it, look at who their roommates were. There are some tech, quote, evangelists out there from major multi-billion dollar companies who are on tons of boards, but look into their background. They have no tech experience. They didn't do any programming, no, no. They never touched a server. They were the roommate or friend of so-and-so and so-and-so. -and -so. They just got in early. I'm not mad at them. Association. But it was their association, and, they, and I'm not saying they weren't productive, but I'm just saying don't beat yourself up if you don't have that specific degree. If you do the background check on a lot of people, they don't. When you see somebody that said that they're all of a sudden a millionaire, billionaire, check their family history. When you read a biography of somebody that's bright and smart, check their associations. You'll find that their parents, one person who's big in tech, his father was a lawyer, his mother was big in business, and they had CEOs who would come to dinner all the time, okay? Because she was at the United Way and places like that. You guys know who it is. They also have a big not-for-profit foundation, recently divorced, but we won't go there. But anyway, but everybody focuses on this guy. Oh, he started in his garage, blah, blah, blah. That's, okay, yeah, but that's bullshit. How many of us have a, a successful lawyer dad that's already networked and a mom that's like networked that like you can just spill ideas on because certain people are coming through your house? So when he had contract issues with IBM or things weren't getting seen, guess who was at dinner? You know, and they didn't force it, it just chance meetings. So I want you to understand that you can do a lot, but be very careful of what leadership you associate yourself with on trying to be a billionaire because their start is not like a lot of our starts. I'm not blaming them for their start, but don't beat yourself up for not getting what they got. We all want to give that next generation that privilege. That's what we should do. But do not be fooled if you're starting at first base or batting with somebody on third base. It's not a good story for them to sell to you in a biography. But you need, if you're gonna be a successful business person, you need to understand everybody's associations because they're gonna be working for you. They're gonna be your partner. And you want the truth. Man, there's so much to dig, to dig into. So what we're gonna do, right, uh, so Rob, uh, the last thing I'm going to leave you with, I'll give you two minutes to think, not that you need the time to think, is if there's anything else as a close that you'd like to leave people with, right? You've got about two minutes. So here's the thing. So next week, um, who here is interested in sustainable cities, smart cities? Raise your hand to see if they're working. Beautiful. Next week, we have a guy, Giancarlo, right? Bright guy. Um, United Nations, UAE, was also working on it. Who knows about NEOM? There's a few people who know about NEOM. Who knows nothing about NEOM? Great. Something for you to research. Okay, I, I won't be that nasty. NEOM uh, was at the Red Sea. It's a project that's being undertaken thousands and thousands and thousands of kilometers to make basically uh, the smartest city in the world to cut a long story short. It's being undertaken as, as, we, as we speak, uh, and he was one of the original people to work on the infrastructure and how the whole thing, sustainable strategic development. So just go NEOM, N-E-O-M, N-E-O-M, just check it out, NEOM Project. It's basically building the city of the future. That's another word for it, but it's thousands and thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of kilometers. And uh, I think 10 or 11 of the world's brightest architects have been invited and paid to come and work on it, right? It's, it's, it's phenomenal. Maybe next week he'll give you a bit of insight into what's really going on, but maybe not on camera. Um, but a phenomenal guy, uh, worked, as I said, has created policy for sustainable city design that nations and governments follow. So like, <laughs> he's an amazing guy. So Giancarlo, America, well, Italian background, but uh, brought up in Florida, in, in the US. So that's next week. So if you're interested in that, make sure you do come. Uh, in the meantime, just quickly wanna uh, give a, a thumbs up to our technical partners, Tropical Nomad. We've got Guzman, IU, but it is around here somewhere. Thank you very much. I mean, again, episode 400. We don't intend to stop anytime. And we've got a co-host, welcome back, Bhavna Parihar. We'll have a chat later. So look,
tonight has been, for me, a really powerful episode because, you know, we came in here maybe with an understanding to talk about certain things. But as with all of these types of interviews, it's the energy of where it's taking you. So where I think tonight has taken us is on this deeper dive into some of the seeds of success, right? And if you were listening, and a lot of you were taking notes, which I love, I see a whole page of notes over here. I want those later, right? I spent two like days with you. I've learned so much and I've made pages of notes like this. So, so Rob, to you and to all of the, uh, I'll give them one, one more mention because many of them are watching now. The Smithsonian guys are watching. Uh, the Kraft Food guys are watching. The Procter and Gamble guys are watching. The Indiana University Association are, work, are watching. The Adelante Foundation from Honduras are watching. The Seafarers Ministry of the Port of Oklahoma, California. Oakland, thank you. That was Oklahoma, didn't I? Yeah, Oakland, thank you very much. Are also watching. So we have this fantastic, um, incredible bunch of associations for you. And that's one of the things that I think has been reinforced so many times is look at those thin threads, the people around you. Look back. Remember the things that you've done, who you've done it with. Remember the people who have been your supporters, right? Don't lose contact with these guys to try and leapfrog like the night into the future, take your time, but make sure you look after those thin threads and, and those associations along the way. Hopefully I haven't stolen the thunder of your, of your closing, but, uh, but that's what's coming over, man. So uh, over to you to see us out, my brother. Uh, first of all, uh, speak up Monday. Thank you, Robert. Uh, great job. Tropical Nomad, phenomenal, uh, phenomenal design, phenomenal property. Uh, you know, the studio team, amazing. Um, I really appreciate everyone who took the time to listen and uh, ask questions and show up here. Those who are watching live and those who will watch in the future. Um, don't just watch this. Check out some of the other ones. How we learn is how we listen. And as you were talking about social, what uh, Robert was talking about Clubhouse is called social audio. What we found out was the power of audio sometimes we need, not just visual and not just typing. Sometimes we need to hear other people. Um, so I would say gratitude, remember, you're not going to remember all the C's, but if you remember at least the top three, chance, choice, and concentration, you know, gratitude, find those you should celebrate, and don't feel bad if you haven't talked to them in a while, celebrate them. Do not let relationships go cold. You may help someone just through association. There's a number of people who end up taking themselves out. And some of people go, oh, I thought I was going to call that person. And you didn't. And that is like destiny telling you, how about you give Sandy, Susie, Jimmy a call? You know, during COVID, almost every two weeks, I lost someone. Okay? I lost someone or I lost someone that was close to someone. Every two weeks, on average. All right? Now, when you have a big net, that's going to happen. And when you're connected to people, that's going to happen. And they were all ages. You know? One, the one gentleman, the last time we bumped into each other was in Australia. He was the, um, a, um, a black American. And we just bumped into each other. We had worked together. And then he went off and I went and we bumped into each other in Sydney, Australia. Next thing I know, he died in COVID. A year later. You know? So, show appreciation and everything like that. So I would say go to acommon1connectivity.com, check it out, not asking for business, but use it as an example. A lot of people write their websites and tell you, they pontificate what they can do. If you really want business, show people what you've done. Because guess what? I'm going to use a bad word. Do it. I'm going to shit what you hope to do. I give a shit what you can do so I can make money. And that's what every company does. Do not fall into the fluffy stuff that companies tell you. Oh, yeah, I want to hear your thing. And, and uh, many of you get taken into that. Oh, I really, no. You need to, until they're your friend, you need to be, I delivered it. This is the problem. This is how I attack it. These are the resources. These are the people involved. 
Do not let them digress you on that fluff stuff. Because they're inter even if they give you a little money, they're kind of interviewing you too. You see what I mean? So I will leave you with this. This is from uh, Wordsworth. Tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream. For the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they seem. Life is real, life is earnest, and the grave, do it this way, and the grave is not our goal. Dust our art, the dust return us, was not spoken of the soul. That enactment, that in sorrow, is our destiny and our way, but to act that each tomorrow finds us further than today. Thank you. Thank you for having me.